For most of us, COVID is in our rear view mirrors, a horrible period where masking, closing restaurants and schools was part of our lives, although fiercely debated. But for some, COVID's tentacles are still strangling, having never left its grip. It's growing stronger. It's called long COVID or long haul COVID. And for many people, it's here to stay. Now, this is Talking Points on CBS News Minnesota. Good evening and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Esme Murphy. CDC figures show that in Minnesota through May of last year, there have been 1.8 million cases of COVID and 16.5 thousand deaths. But COVID has not left us. The state estimates that so far this year, more than 220 people have died from COVID. And then there is long COVID. Minnesota Department of Health estimates that as many as 400,000 people in Minnesota could be suffering in cases that range from relatively mild to some that are severe, even life changing. Tonight in Talking Points, we will look at the growing effort to track long COVID and to find some kind of treatment. Tonight, you will hear from three long COVID sufferers who I found in a long COVID support group on Facebook. They're telling their stories in an effort to let other people know they too could be suffering from long COVID, which is initially often misdiagnosed and often amplifies a wide array of existing ailments in our bodies. We'll hear from experts doing their best to track and treat this condition. So first, let's hear from the head of the long COVID clinic at Fairview Hospital. Well, joining us right now, Dr. Tanya Melnick. She is a doctor with M Health Fairview. She's also a professor at the University of Minnesota Medical School. And you also have opened since December of 2020, you have the M Health Fairview Adult Post-COVID Clinic, uh, which is getting a lot of patients. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely, thank you for inviting me. When you first opened this clinic in December of 2020, what was the need that you saw and what were the, the kinds of symptoms that you were seeing in people? We started seeing patients um, with symptoms of what looked like not completely resolving acute COVID. So that initial illness with a lot of fatigue, sometimes shortness of breath and cough was not going away as expected. And um, that was recognized by patients first and through it, very amazing advocacy efforts, um, medical community accepted it and started to recognize it. And the need for clinic was recognized um, at that point. Now, is there a specific test like there is for strep throat or, or do you have to just kind of sort through a bunch of things? How do you determine if somebody has it? I wish there was a simple test, but typically what needs to happen is very detailed um, review of symptoms, their timing, um, review of what was going on with patients' health even before COVID, because sometimes it's not um, COVID that started the whole thing. COVID sometimes triggers worsening of problems that existed before it, they just come to light. And sometimes um, other things happen. It may be COVID, but that could be another thing thrown into the mix. We're all human. We develop all sorts of different conditions as we live. So it, it can amplify actually some, an existing problem or existing, existing weakness in your body. How do you treat it? Is, is there any way to sing, singularly treat this? Um, COVID, and, well, actually long COVID is likely a, a combination of several effects. This is where science is pointing to. There could be multiple mechanisms at play at the same time. Um, there could be an immune system dysregulation where all of a sudden healthy tissue is getting attacked like with autoimmune disease. There might be a virus still persisting in the body. It still might be multiplying somewhere and that drives that response. There could be other viruses being more active. And um, that inflammation that kind of starts the whole thing that may change how tissues function. And what combination of factors are driving um, symptoms for any given patient is often very, very difficult, if not impossible to determine. So there is no one approach where- Inflation? Inflammation. Or inflammation, excuse me, not inflation. Um, inflammation, in what, what, how does that manifest itself? Well, that depends on where the inflammation is. Sometimes when it's in the lungs, people continue to have shortness of breath or cough. Um, sometimes, and there is a, one other hypothesis of what could be causing the brain fog and fatigue, there might be um, inflammation somewhere in 
the, in the brain tissue itself. Wow. Can you, well, how do you treat this? Is there any treatment or are you just treating the symptoms? Well, because there is really no one mechanism to explain all of it, there is really no one treatment. Um, at this point, we're mostly trying to support patients with recovery. There are some interventions and some medications that could be helpful with symptoms, but we don't have anything that's been tested in clinical studies and found to be effective for all of the symptoms. There are studies that are ongoing that will look at several treatment options. Um, and if patients are out there and they're looking for treatment option, the best option and most most that they can do for themselves and probably for science and other patients is to find a clinical trial and try to join it, see if they're meeting criteria. And oftentimes research team can answer those questions. But this is where we at. We are still in the process of doing studies and finding something that's going to be effective. Okay. Um, and often it sounds like it might be misdiagnosed. Um, I don't know if it could be misdiagnosed. Um, sometimes because there are other things that long COVID can make worse, we may have to kind of tease it out from, um, from long COVID related fatigue and try to address that. For example, insomnia is extremely common. So addressing insomnia would benefit the long COVID fatigue, not necessarily fix it, but definitely make it better and potentially more uh, tolerable. Well, Dr. Melnick, thank you so much. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. Up next, a state expert who is in the middle of a massive study to track long COVID cases here, and we'll hear from one of our long COVID patients, an ex-firefighter and dispatcher who caught COVID on the job. Well, joining us right now is Kate Murray. She is the program manager and unit supervisor for long COVID and post COVID conditions. A long title, but very important one. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Esme. All right, let me ask you, what is the difference between long COVID and post COVID conditions? Right, so that's a good question. Long COVID and post COVID conditions are both kind of umbrella terms and sometimes they are describing the same thing. Um, long COVID tends to be more familiar to people. They might also call it long haulers or long haul COVID, um, but both of those describe uh, symptoms and uh, complications happening after a COVID-19 infection. So there is the long COVID that is basically a new chronic disease for a lot of people. And this is where we hear about the debilitating fatigue, brain fog, ongoing cough, um, some of those symptoms. Post-COVID conditions could also include things like uh, stroke or new diabetes after COVID-19. You know, there are other... Oh, wow. That we unhealth, and we want to try to monitor and understand those as well. So you can have uh, connected to COVID could be a, a stroke without any of these other symptoms. There is a risk of different clotting events in the months after having a COVID nineteen infection. So we have heard of folks who, younger folks who have have experienced stroke or cardiovascular events uh, in the months following a COVID nineteen infection, and sometimes those have long term consequences. And it, does that include things like uh, heart arrhythmia and heart issues? Yes, the heart palpitations are a big one. And actually that may have to do with kind of the autonomic nervous system impact of COVID-19. So for some people, it really impacts the part of the nervous system that regulates things like heart rate and blood pressure. And so there's kind of a subset of long COVID patients who have this POTS syndrome, where when they change positions from sitting to standing or lying down to sitting, they, their, immune, or, uh, excuse me, their nervous system sort of goes haywire and their heart rate goes through the roof. Um, they get very lightheaded. Some people faint. Um, they can oh, wow. also, it's very distressing, clearly, and can be very um, You're in the midst of, of a big study uh, statewide uh, to assess you know, the long COVID situation in Minnesota. Tell us about that. What, what are the goals and, and what are you doing? When do you hope to have the data out for us? Sure. So last year we did a statewide phone survey of people who had confirmed COVID-19 cases in the years prior. And we called folks and asked about things like uh, new symptoms or ongoing symptoms, but not just about impacts on their health. We also asked about things like changes in job status or disability status, if the symptoms were impacting their quality of life in other ways, 
what their experience with the healthcare system had been with these symptoms. So it really is a broad um, look at the impacts of long COVID across the state. Um, there's also a pilot survey in McLeod County that is following folks with confirmed COVID-19. So those are just two ways that we're trying to understand these impacts. We also have some grantees who will be joining us soon, and they are going to be doing some more in-depth assessments in communities, which is really important. They're going to be coming from uh, communities disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And we know there's probably some disproportionate impacts of long COVID as well. What are the, do you have any idea what the percentage might be of people who have long haul symptoms or who have some of these post COVID symptoms? Yeah, it's a, it's a hard question to answer because it is an umbrella term and there's a lot of different definitions that are used in studies. And so you can't compare numbers across studies all the time because they're using different definitions of long COVID. They're, uh, uh, the ways they're gathering that data may over or underestimate the prevalence. We also don't know the denominator anymore. We need to know, you know, who's had COVID in order to know if they develop long COVID. And with home testing and people not testing as much, it's hard to know who has had COVID. That said, you know, there are a range of estimates out there. CDC estimated 5 to 15 percent of people with COVID-19 may go on to develop long COVID. Uh, they also have a, a long-term uh, survey that they're doing in households, and that has shown it to be around 7% of all adults in Minnesota uh, who may be currently experiencing symptoms of long COVID. So oh that God. may be an overestimate because it's a voluntary survey, but the long and short of it is we know there are a lot of people impacted. We're hearing from them, um, and so this is something we need to keep trying to understand and support those folks. All right, Kate Murray, thank you so much. Great information as always. Thank you so much. Joining us right now is Shane Hendricks. He has been a volunteer firefighter, also worked as a dispatcher, uh, and is no longer working and is no longer a volunteer firefighter all because of COVID. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Tell us how you think you got COVID, the likelihood that it probably happened when you were serving. On the fire department. Um we had a bunch of calls. I mean, it was, you know, people would call because their oxygen levels were dropping or because they felt sick. Um, and then people were also scared to call 911, I think, because they didn't want to, because we were interacting with so many people. But, you know, it, it came to a point where you had to tell people whether, I don't know what you really want us to do. There's not much we can do because you have the symptoms of COVID. There's no stopping it. Um, you kind of have to wear it out. What are your symptoms? Oh, for long COVID right now? Um, so right now I have I have neurological dysfunction called autonomic dysfunction. It's right below POTS. So when I go from sitting to standing, my blood pressure drops 50 points, um, causing me to pass out, fall. Um, they put me on some meds that raises my blood pressure. So a normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. Mine runs 160, 170 over 100. So it's quite a bit higher than it should be, but that's to prevent me from falling. It's slowed down from three to four falls a week to probably oh my gosh. one fall a week. My biggest one being three weeks ago when I fell down the stairs and um, was knocked out and ended up going to the ER for um, a while. Probably, I mean, I've, I've had several concussions due to this. What would you, why are you taking part in sharing your story? I think it's important to get it out there. Um, just the fact I haven't worked. I was very active. I was working three jobs. I had dispatch. I was doing fire, uh, which is a very physical job. And I was also working at the stadiums on their medical team during events. So I was very active. I was working tons of hours. Um, you know, at dispatch, I was working 12 to 16 hour days. Um, I worked a ton. And now it's, I'm not allowed to drive anymore due to the passing out. I have chronic fatigue, chronic pain. My eyes are messed up. They move independently, kind of like a lizard. So I now have to wear prism glasses. Um, wow. And then there's, there's the fight with workers comp to get stuff covered, right? So it took me almost a year to start getting treatment. And I don't know if that's prolonged the long COVID and made it almost irreversible now. Um, and, and after like eight, nine months, my wife and I made the decision, we're just going to start paying out of pocket for stuff. Uh, cause we had to change insurance to hers, um, where I worked, dropped my insurance after six months. 
Um, so we had to switch to her insurance, which isn't as good, pays a lot out of pocket. Um, so, I mean, we struggled a little bit until stuff started getting covered and there's still things, uh, they don't believe I need to go to physical therapy or chiropractic for pain, um, which several doctors have recommended. Um, they even, I got a letter last week saying, we know you can't drive, but we want you to come back to work because our independent doctor said, uh, you can move your head 10% of the time and you could sit. Um, wow. and I'm like, how am I supposed to look at six monitors and move my head? 10% of the time, not to mention I'm so fatigued. I nap. I mean, I always tell people I sleep like a baby, right? Cause I sleep like three hours at a time. Maybe I'm up for a couple and then I sleep three, four hours up for a couple. I sleep in naps because the pain's so intense. I, I can't get a good night's rest. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, I've got to cut you off cause we're running out of time. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. You're welcome. Up next, two more patients whose lives have been changed by long COVID forever. Well, joining us right now is Lisa Pettigrew from St. Paul, and your life has changed completely because of long COVID. Can you just tell us some of your symptoms? Yes, um, I have chronic fatigue. Um, so I am extremely tired and exhausted pretty much all of the time. And from the time I wake up, I wake up tired. <laughs> you know, I spend the day tired. Um, that's my main symptom. What did your life used to look like? Because I know before this, you were a very active woman. Yeah. Yeah. Mornings were great for me. I wake up early. I swam three to four times a week in the mornings before work. Um, other activities for myself seasonally would be cross country skiing or paddle boarding, roller blading, riding my bike, um, active most days of the week and really appreciated my health. I felt very grateful for having good health and for being able to be so active. And you got COVID in uh, May or March of 2020 and you suddenly realized within the following year that you were having these symptoms. I mean, what are you not able to do right now? Are you able? Yeah. To, are you able to paddleboard right now? Oh no, I don't paddleboard. I don't swim. I don't. Uh, I've cross country skied a couple times. Um, it's exhausting. I can't go. <laughs> I mean, it's slow going. And and the thing about doing exercise is after I exert myself. I don't feel energized. I feel worse. It doesn't, it doesn't build up my strength. It saps me of my strength. And so my, I don't have the, I have the desire to do that, but I don't have, I, uh, I'm sort of stuck because I'm worried about how I'm going to feel. I'm going to feel worse doing exercise. So I'm not as um, motivated to do it. I also have vertigo, which is not great when you're doing any of those activities. And um, yeah, those are my primary symptoms is the fatigue and the vertigo and the... Um, and mentally, just quickly, this must be just overwhelming. Right, right. So the added part of that is a feeling of um, depression and anxiety. And so those are um, some of the symptoms I've had as a result of this, because I'm not out and active. I don't have the life I had before. I, my life is very isolating and restricted. And um, sometimes I feel like I'm in a nursing home in my own home. That's how active I am. I sit in a chair, I lay on the couch, I get work done, but I have no life. I don't have a social life. I see activities to do and I think, wouldn't that be great? But I can't do them. I'm not doing them. Occasionally I will get out and then I'm exhausted. Um, so I feel like I've aged 30 years since I got COVID. Well, listen, um, I, I'm so sorry. And I, I so appreciate your sharing with this. And I'm sure a lot of our viewers will uh, appreciate your sharing too. Thank you so much. Well, joining us right now is Galen Smith, who was kind enough to respond to my Facebook posts looking for people who would suffer from long COVID. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, glad to be here. Now, you managed to not get COVID until August of 2023, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, 
And then afterwards you got long COVID. What were your symptoms like, and what are your symptoms for long COVID? Yeah, my initial symptoms with my, when I had COVID were very, um, was like, I was pretty sick, but I wasn't hospitalized right. or anything like that. Um, and now um, I'd say the prime, I, the way I've described it is um, I've experienced a brain injury in the past, and this feels more like a brain injury than any flu I've ever had. And there's a lot of overlapping symptoms. Um, and I, so I, I feel like the overarching, I mean, fatigue is prevalent and fatigue is like a really insufficient word for it. <laughs> um, I feel like it's like if you've ever had surgery and, you know, you're just like, gosh, I just can't get my energy back, you know, and it takes a few weeks. It's like that, but like for months and months and months and months. Um, yeah. is, is there any, a lot of people talk about brain fog. Is there yeah. any? Is there anything absolutely like yeah absolutely i'm i'm not a like um tracking time is hard um like remembering things is hard um being able to do multi-step um like doing things that take multiple steps is hard um my dog is visiting us um right. uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we all know about that when this is you know years of zoom um and yeah so definitely brain fog and then i think generally like it's like the medical word for it is dysautonomia which also doesn't really tell you anything <laughs> but like it's like my it's sometimes i say it's like my lungs forgot how to breathe and like my, my my heart forgot how to have a steady beat like i've been through cardiology like my heart the muscle is healthy that's not always the case some people have real cardiac issues but um i am having arrhythmias i've never had before that are really hard wow. to live with wow. um it's like and, and like my sleep is all wonky and it's like it's like all the things that your body does autom automatically my body doesn't quite do automatically in the same way anymore um, why did you decide to, to be willing to share your story with us? We're very grateful that you are. Yeah. Um, I think it's important for people to understand what their friends and family and neighbors are living with. I think it's unlikely there isn't at least one person on your block or in your family or in your communities that's living with long COVID. Um, and I also think that what any time we or people in our communities are sick or disabled that gives us an opportunity to care for each other and like i want folks to know if they're not able to do all the same things they could do since they've had covid which is a lot of people even if they haven't identified it as long covid just being honest about what you actually can and can't do and asking for help and support i think can like i think it can be world changing well gail thank you so much that was great i really appreciate it yeah absolutely and that does it for this edition of Talking Points. As always, feel free to email me with comments and suggestions at esme at cbs.com. The show airs every Wednesday and Thursday at 6.30 and 9.30, and on Friday, posts on YouTube for on-demand viewing. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Esme Murphy, WCCO News.